Uh, my name is Igor. I work on compilers at Apple in London. Welcome to this talk about Swift and C++ interoperability. I want to start by giving you some numbers. This one might be familiar to a lot of you. According to some research, more than half of exploitable software security vulnerabilities are caused by issues with memory safety. Solving just this single source of vulnerabilities alone would tremendously improve the overall security of the software that we all ship. Ideally, we would switch to a modern memory-safe language like Swift. Swift was introduced in 2014. It is memory-safe by default. It is natively compiled to many platforms like Darwin, Linux, Windows, and others. Something that is important for this project and for this conference is that Swift leverages Cling and LLVM for compilation. Swift code is compiled down to SIL, which stands for Swift Intermediate Language, which is then compiled down to LLVM AR. The problem with switching to another language is that the amount of existing C++ code is huge. Let's consider the LLVM project, for example. It has over 1 million of C++ lines of code in Clang alone, excluding tests. This code is not going away anytime soon, so the solution that we come up with needs to interoperate quite well with this large amount of existing C++ code. So, how do we gradually move towards memory safety and towards Swift? Let's talk about some of the goals of Swift and C++ interoperability project. We would like to allow incremental addition of new Swift code into existing C++ code bases. One example of this is the Swift compiler itself, which is a huge C++ code base. Over the past few years, we wrote a lot of new compiler source code in Swift, and it is built along with the C++ code and deployed in production. Rewriting large and fast evolving C++ code bases in Swift is usually not an option. Maintaining two distinct versions of the same code base, one with Swift and one without Swift, is usually not feasible for most projects because it requires a lot of active engineering effort. This is why I put emphasis on incremental. Anyone adopting Swift should be able to implement small parts of new functionality in Swift while maintaining the project in a buildable and testable state on every step of the way. We would also like to allow developers writing Swift code in Swift-only projects to use C++ libraries from their Swift source code. This would be super useful, for instance, for macOS and iOS apps that use scientific libraries written in C++. For some of those use cases, it is important to avoid significant performance overhead. Let's also explicitly mention some of the non-goals of this project. First, making every single C++ API out there available in Swift. The fact that this is a non-goal is a consequence of our goals to preserve Swift's memory safety and security guarantees. C++ APIs often don't provide the same level of security guarantees that we require in Swift. Next, allowing you to write the exact same code as you would in C++ but in a different language. This is a non-go because the languages have fundamental differences. A lot of commonly used C++ idioms don't map one-to-one -to, -one to Swift, and that's okay. For most of them, there is a better way to do it in Swift. The code, however, won't always be identical to C++. A great example of this are C++ iterators. Most C++ iterator types store pointers to a specific part of the underlying container. This is fundamentally unsafe because there is no indication at compile time that the iterator requires the underlying container to be alive during its use. So there is no reliable way for the compiler to ensure correct lifetimes. And this has led to security issues in the past. We don't want to bring this common source of unsafety into Swift. So C++ iterators are not directly available in Swift. We provide an alternative interface for working with C++ containers from Swift that I will talk about in more detail a bit later. Next, making fundamental changes to the Swift language for the sole purpose of better matching C++ idioms is also a non-goal. For instance, we will not introduce a C++-style preprocessor into Swift just because it would allow us to better interoperate with certain C++ APIs. <coughs> 
we are also not going to be adding Spinae into Swift. And last but not least, developing a dialect of either C++ or Swift for this purpose is also a non-goal. Now I wanna give you an example. Let's assume we are implementing a new feature in LLVM and we need to handle a certain IR attribute. So we are working with LLVM attribute set. You can see a super simplified definition on the slide. And we just need to check if an attribute is present in the attribute set. Here's how you could do it in C++. You would just call a method that's defined on the attribute set class. And here's how you would do it in Swift. It works almost exactly the same way. The function gets an attribute set as a parameter and invokes a method on it. All right, now let's talk about how this actually works under the hood. As I've already mentioned, the Swift compiler embeds Clang and uses its APIs extensively. Now I'm going to show you the overall control flow between the Swift compiler and Clang on a very high level. Let's say we have a Swift source file that has an import statement. It imports Clang underscore AST, which is a Clang module. It has a module map file that lists the C++ headers that belong to this module. When Swift is compiling the source file, it will see the import statement and it will try to load the module called Clang underscore AST. Since there is no module with this name that's implemented in Swift, the compiler will query Clang to find that module. It will use Clang's compiler instance API for this. Clang will then find the module decoration, will retrieve the list of headers that are part of this module, and it will parse them and return the AST back to the Swift compiler. Swift will then traverse the AST using Clang's Decl Visitor API. And it will generate Swift AST that represents the Clang AST, mapping supported C++ decals to their Swift counterparts. Swift will then emit LLVM IR for the Swift code. And it will ask Clang to emit LLVM IR for the C++ code for instance, for inline functions defined in C++ headers. And finally, LLVM would emit the actual machine code for the IR. So how does this work if we want to do the opposite, use a Swift library from C++ code? Let's say we have a Swift library that declares a public Swift function. During the compilation of this library, Swift will emit not only the resulting binary for the library, but also a C++ header that provides an interface for C++ to call into the Swift APIs. In this case, the header will have a function that will call directly into the Swift function. The function will be declared as inline in C++ for better performance. Now, if we have a C++ source file, we can just include the generated C++ header and then just invoke Clang, which will emit IR that will contain the calls into the Swift binaries. And then LLVM will emit machine code as usual. Now let's talk in a bit more detail about how the actual conversion from a Clang declaration to a Swift declaration works. I will also mention some of the challenges in mapping C++ to a different language, like Swift. Swift has two different kinds of a type. A Swift type can be declared as a struct or as a class. Structs are value types that don't have a distinct pointer identity. So Swift doesn't guarantee you that an instance of a struct would have a stable address in memory. Classes, on the other hand, are reference types. They are automatically reference counted they are generally stored on the heap, and they can be inherited from one another. In C++, there is no clear distinction between value types and reference types. Most C++ types that are stored on the stack, such as std vector, are mapped to Swift structs, and C++ types that are stored on the heap and passed as pointers or references 
such as calling AST context, are mapped to Swift classes. Some C++ types don't fit into either of these categories, and we generally don't import those types into Swift. As I've already mentioned before, introducing fundamental changes into the Swift language to accommodate C++ is not something we are willing to do. C++ code bases tend to use pointers ubiquitously, and this presents a danger to Swift and C++ interoperability. The main source of this danger comes from the difference in memory management models between the two languages. While C++ uses lexical lifetimes, meaning that a value will generally get deallocated at the end of the, at the, end of the block where it is declared, Swift can deallocate a value after its last use, and the last use is determined statically. So, if a C++ method returns a pointer, the Swift compiler has no way of knowing if the lifetime of the pointer is somehow attached to the lifetime of the value on which the method was invoked. There just isn't any information available about that statically to the Swift compiler. I'll give you an example. Let's write a simple C++ function that iterates over a stat vector of ints and prints every element this function is entirely reasonable from the point of view of memory safety. The stud vector will only get deallocated after the function executes entirely. Now let's try to translate this function to Swift. Here we are creating a vector, getting two iterators out of it, begin and end, and using them to iterate over the vector, which looks very similar to C++. However, because Swift can destroy the vector after its last use. Later, we get a crash when trying to dereference an iterator, because the backend collection of the iterator is already destroyed at that point. So, iterator types generally are not safe to be used from Swift, because they often store a pointer to an element of the backend collection, and this lifetime dependency is not expressed statically. This is why we don't expose C++ iterator types in Swift. And begin and end methods are also not available in Swift. To allow using C++ containers from Swift, we provide an alternative approach. We use C++ named requirements to classify C++ iterator types into several categories and map the containers to several Swift protocol types. For instance, a C++ container that exposes input iterators will be mapped to a Swift sequence. This will give Swift developers access to Swift standard library APIs such as map, filter, and reduce. If a C++ container exposes iterators that provide random access, Swift will additionally map the container to a Swift random access collection. This will provide a lot of extra APIs such as contains, suffix, prefix, drop while, split, and others. In both cases, the Swift compiler will handle the lifetime of the C++ container, so you wouldn't have to think about lifetimes when writing Swift code. So let's take a look at LLVM attribute set once again, but this time let's do something a little bit more complicated with it. Let's say we need to get a list of attributes where every, att where every attribute is paired with its index. Here's how you could do it in C++. You would first create an empty vector, then you would call dot .begin to create an iterator, and then you would use a for loop to iterate over the attribute set. And after every iteration, you would increment both the iterator and an extra index variable. And here's how simple this would be in Swift. Instead of calling begin and end methods, you would call enumerated method. This method is a part of the Swift standard library. It is declared on a Swift sequence protocol and it is available for LLVM attribute set thanks to the ma mapping mechanism that I recently mentioned. This project isn't fully complete yet. We have some open challenges that we still need to tackle. One of them is mapping C++ class templates to Swift. C++ templates are fundamentally different from Swift generics which makes it difficult to map them to one another. Another open question is how we should map C++ class inheritance to Swift. 
Swift structs don't support inheritance. Swift classes support inheritance, but not multiple inheritance, which is often used in C++. This project is entirely open source. It is a part of the larger Swift open source umbrella. All of our compiler source code is on GitHub. We have an open source work group dedicated to Swift and C++ interoperability. The work group, for instance, holds weekly office hours meetings. And we also have documentation for this feature available on the Swift.org website. If any of this caught your attention, we would greatly appreciate contributions. Uh, and thanks for coming to this talk. It's time for me to answer questions now, if there are any. Thanks, Igor. So for the questions, we have mics over there, and I can handle microphone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, you talked a lot about the way that you map uh, APIs so that they're safe and idiomatic and so on, which is fantastic. Where do those kind of rules for how those mappings work live? Because they're an important part of like API services that you need to maintain. Right, that's a good point. Uh, so we have certain heuristics uh, to distinguish between uh, a value type and a reference type. We basically assume that everything is a value type unless we have reasons to believe otherwise. Uh, you can annotate uh, C++ APIs with Clang attributes for this. Uh, you can also use API nodes if for some reason you cannot modify the actual C++ headers. Uh, API nodes were very recently upstreamed so then already using the uh, upstream LLVM as well. Uh, for, the, uh, for the collection conformances, we use some logic that is uh, basically hard-coded in the compiler. Uh, it is uh, quite generic, so it, it is also available for custom collections, not just for standard library collections, but it is still um, functionality that is specific to collections, so we, we still need to hard-code it in the compiler, basically. Uh, there are a few other, um, th there's some extra logic uh, to make um, the standard library more convenient from Swift. So we have, uh, for instance, conversions from uh, stud, stud strings to Swift strings uh, and vice versa. Uh, that logic is um, also uh, like implemented in a, sp it's implemented in a special Swift module that's shipped with the toolchain. Any other questions? More questions? Thank you, Igor, for the talk. Thank you.